Thanks, Adam. Uh, so when I started working on this presentation, I wasn't sure how I was going to present it. Uh, generally, I form an outline and then start building slides around the outline. Uh, but this time, my outline was just a list of names and teams, so I was, really wasn't sure what to do. Uh, so I just started writing. And before I knew it, I had like a 4,000 word speech. And I've never given a speech at a conference before, so I wasn't sure you know, how this would go over. Uh, and yesterday, during the morning presentations, I was talking to Monica Piotrowitz and about like how I wasn't sure how this would go. And we started joking about just showing random images and referencing them as if they were part of my actual talk. And then in the afternoon, uh, Jim John Dim uh, gave his fun with speech presentation. And in the presentation, he showed an app that he built called Talk Show. And Talk Show listens to your conversation and then does Flickr searches to find images about what you're talking about. Uh, so it seemed like a perfect fit. Uh, so after his presentation, I talked to him about it. And uh, he made some modifications that will hopefully make it work better than uh, it was working yesterday. And uh, so that's going to be running for the entirety of my talk. And we'll see how this goes. So. <laughs> So when most people think of jQuery UI, they think of a set of JavaScript widgets. The typical user doesn't think about how jQuery UI is built, the decisions behind the designs and implementations, or who's involved in the project. This isn't unique to jQuery UI, though. Uh, when, you, when using a library, whether it's open source or not, developers tend to just think about the code. Uh, and they don't think about the team and process behind that code. So I'd like to start by getting an understanding of how the audience uh, views not just jQuery UI, but all jQuery projects. So I'm going to need somebody from the audience, a couple people actually, to give me answers. You probably don't need to go up to the microphone. You can just shout out a number. Uh, how many people do you think are on the jQuery UI team? 40. 40. 10. 12. One more number. <clears throat> OK, so how many people think that it's 40? Not even the person that guessed it. One, two. <laughs> How many people think there are three and a half people on the team? Yeah? How many people think there are 12 people on the team? OK. How many people think there are 10 people on the team? Uh, so the majority was 12. Uh, there are actually eight people on the jQuery UI team. So how many people do you think are on the jQuery core team? Six. One, one more guess? Nobody? OK, so how many people think there are 40 people on the jQuery core team? Yeah, nobody? How many people think there are six people? Yeah, that's pretty close. There are nine people. Um, <clears throat> so for, for perspective, <laughs> for perspective, let's uh, get the entire jQuery team up here. So this is going to be jQuery core, jQuery UI, jQuery mobile, everybody, the events team, anybody that does anything on jQuery foundation. How many people do you think are going to come up here? We need a smaller stage. <laughs> <laughs> So for perspective, there are nine people on the jQuery core team, uh, about 37 people on the full team. That may be a little bit off. We've added a few people recently. Uh, there are about a little over 400 of you in the audience, uh, about 15 million people employed to build websites, about 60 million websites using jQuery. Uh, and so there, with, you know, there are about 7 billion people in the world at this point. Uh, and so it's probably safe to say that at least one billion of them are end users of jQuery. Uh, and so this is the team that manages everything, right? So writing code, managing infrastructure, putting on conferences, uh, writing documentation. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is, this is it. This is the team. Now they're all going to do the Macarena. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you might break yeah. <laughs> so because the team is so small, 
uh, we, we really need the involvement of the community. So to date, there have been about 1,200 pull requests against jQuery UI. Uh, so how many do you think of, of the 1,200 came from the community as opposed to people that are committers on jQuery UI? 40. <laughs> 40? Other guesses? What? Half? So 600? Any other guesses? How many people think it's closer to 40 than 600? Yeah, how many people think it's closer to 600? Wow, that's not 100%. Um, the answer is 900 of them. So three quarters of our pull requests have come from the community, right? And the, just the sheer number of pull requests is kind of crazy, because if you think about it, if that was one pull request a day, that's almost three years of pull requests from the community. Uh, so since moving to GitHub, there have been a little over 3,500 commits to jQuery UI. So what percentage do you think came from the community? 40. 80. Any, what was the last guess? 70. Wow, you guys think this is like huge community, huh? How many people think that it was 70% uh, of commits? How many people think that it's 40% of commits? Yeah, does anyone want to take another guess? 15%? How many people think it's 15%? Not that many people. That's actually extremely close. Uh, for a lot of releases, it is almost exactly 15%. Uh, since the day that we moved to GitHub, it's 13%. Um, so there was definitely some on-ramp time. Uh, there's also, this number is kind of skewed because there are community members like uh, Felix Nagel who was not on the team, just started working on select venue and has hundreds of commits and is now on the team. And so had he not been on the team before I gave this, this number would be like massively higher. Uh, and we actually have a lot of people like that where you know, that, that's how you get on the team is you start as a community member, you start making some commits and over time you just get involved in the project and if you're around for a while and you're reliable and you're doing good work, you just become part of the team. Uh, so, that could happen for any of you. Uh, so other than what is essentially a collection of random users on GitHub, uh, are there any teams or projects that you guys think that the jQuery UI team collaborates with? Anybody? No? Yes, we do all the work by ourselves. Uh, we actually work with a number of different uh, teams and groups, and they range from open source projects to standards bodies and browser vendors. Uh, so it, as I mentioned earlier, we have millions of direct users and at least a billion end users. Uh, so this means that we don't actually have an archetypal user. Our users range from designers to inexperienced developers to highly experienced developers building applications and frameworks. Um, the, <laughs> the, the users could have uh, fiber optics running straight into their home where they could be connecting over shoddy cellular networks. Uh, they might be using a small low-res screen or uh, a retina display or maybe a screen magnifier or even a screen reader. Uh, yet we try to provide the best user experience to everyone. And doing so requires us to rely on the knowledge and experience of lots of other people. Uh, so working with other teams is mutually beneficial because we can provide feedback and insight from our vast user base and past experiences uh, while, while gaining the knowledge of the other teams. So a few weeks ago during our annual State of jQuery series of blog posts, Dave Methvin wrote about jQuery Foundation's involvement in web standards. Uh, and while members of the jQuery team are involved in all aspects of web standards, right, we work with Watwig, W3C, and uh, ECMA TC39, uh, for this talk I'm just going to talk about the direct involvement of members of the jQuery UI team. So with the new input types and other APIs, uh, being introduced in web standards, it's becoming increasingly more common for there to be overlap between jQuery UI and the web standards. And so this provides a great opportunity for the jQuery UI team to provide feedback to the standards bodies. Uh, for example, when the new number-based input types came out, we noticed that our spinner widget had step up and step down methods that defaulted to taking one step, but the uh, Watwig spec said that they defaulted to taking zero steps. So essentially these APIs were designed 
to take exactly one parameter, right? It, 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 they weren't expecting people to call, you know, element.step up and have it do something. You'd have to say element.step up one. Uh, and so uh, we just posted a, on the Whatwig mailing list explaining, you know, what developers would expect, and a week later the spec was updated. Uh, so providing feedback based on actual usage by web developers is greatly beneficial to the standards process. Uh, standards bodies and browser vendors love being able to test APIs through JavaScript implementations before they finalize a spec or implement something directly in a browser. And we're starting to see teams like Polymer take on this work. And that way they can, uh, you know, get some APIs in front of developers and have developers actually test them without tying themselves into a finalized spec or having something directly in their browser. And once they feel comfortable with the API, then they can finalize the spec and implement it in the browser. Uh, so with jQuery UI being used on over 6 million sites and averaging 10,000 downloads a day, we're able to easily gauge how users <laughs> <laughs> respond to certain things. Uh, one, one example of this is focus handling within a dialogue. We've tried a few different implementations. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what the best implementation is. And the problem right now is the ARIA specification says one thing, and the HTML specification says something else. Uh, and we know from experience that users don't think that either model is ideal. Uh, so we'll just keep iterating on this, trying to find something that uh, we think is the best way to handle focusing in a dialogue. And once we have uh, a good proposal, we'll talk to W3C and Wattwig and try to get both specs aligned and, you know, actually doing something that users expect. Uh, and then, of course, there's touch support. How many people here have heard my spiel about why touch events aren't supported in jQuery UI? Oh, not that many. Okay, so... <laughs> all right, so back in February 2009, Paul Bacalch, the creator of jQuery UI, uh, filed a ticket about adding touch support to jQuery UI, and he, he included a patch with the ticket. And I pointed out that supporting a proprietary event system through user agent sniffing wasn't a good idea. Uh, and it would have been easy to replace the user agent sniffing, right? It was actually checking specifically for an iPhone, so we would have been having a lot of fun updating that all the time. Um, that would have been easy to, to swap out for like a proper feature detection. But it wouldn't have helped with the mess that ensued over the next few years anyway. So because touch events only existed in Apple's proprietary fork of WebKit, there was no open standard for us to follow. And you could certainly argue that ideological zealotry has held us back while other libraries have been advancing and making, you know, really useful things that work on touch devices. Uh, but I'd like to point out what happened because Apple kind of worked in a vacuum and there was no standards process at all for a year and a half, actually for two and a half years. Uh, so for the first year and a half, the code only existed in Apple's proprietary fork. And eventually it landed in the main WebKit repo, but it was just reverse engineered by Google. Uh, so half a year later, Mozilla implemented their own touch events with a completely different API. And unfortunately that never caught on, probably because Mozilla doesn't have the kind of market share that WebKit has. Uh, so at this point, I need to ask my favorite question. Has anybody ever used Mozilla's touch events? I didn't know they Two people? For real? Yeah? Did you like it? No? Do you, do you like WebKit's touch events? Oh, this is so disappointing. The first person I've ever met that has used Mozilla's touch events and you didn't like them. Waiting for a treat because they're basically getting standardized as pointer events now. Um, <laughs> so eventually Microsoft released IE10 developer preview uh, and it had yet another approach called pointer events. And pointer events are actually pretty similar to Mozilla's touch events uh, where the events themselves look like mouse events, right? So the event has a, you know, an X and Y coordinate attached to it. You don't have a, a touch list, right? So touch events are basically a conglomeration of events smashed together, which is kind of annoying. Uh, so at that point, there were three competing event models. There was the WebKit touch events, the Mozilla touch events, and Microsoft's pointer events. Uh, so during this time, Mozilla abandoned their event model in order to deal with WebCompat, and they just adopted the WebKit model. 
And at the same time, the W3C formed the Web Events Working Group in order to standardize touch events. And we're basically just specking what already existed in browsers. Um, so the working group had representation from every browser vendor except for Apple. Uh, but even the working group wasn't really happy with the specification. It, it was really just a formality to deal with WebCompat. So I represented the jQuery Foundation in this working group, and I tried to bring community awareness around the problems. And you know, that included legal issues around patents, awkward APIs, and a dreary future. As part of this work, I published a blog post on the jQuery blog, uh, and it contained a call to action for Microsoft to submit a proposal to the W3C to finally standardize pointer events. And I'm happy to say that Microsoft did submit a proposal, and there is now a pointer events working group that's making really good progress. And Opera, Firefox, and Chrome are all currently working on an implementation of pointer events. Uh, Apple is still refusing to even engage in the conversation. Um, so we're working with the Polymer team to get a polyfill in front of as many developers as possible so that people can start using pointer events right away, even in old IE. So we want to make sure uh, that everyone starts doing this as soon as they can. And so we had a discussion with MS Open Tech and the Polymer team to discuss you know, what the best way forward was. We didn't want to see a million polyfills popping up and getting like a fragmented community because pointer events are actually pretty tough to polyfill. Uh, so uh, what we're doing is we are using Polymer's pointer events polyfill, but that only works in IE9+. Plus. And so we've made changes to the code. Uh, actually, Chris Borchers went through and found everything that wouldn't at least parse in old IE, things like getters and using delete as a property name without quoting it. And he made all the necessary changes to get the code to at least parse in old IE. And then I went through and added hooks so that we could just throw jQuery in. So instead of having Polymer do event dispatching, jQuery would do the event dispatching. Instead of having Polymer do event registration, jQuery would do event registration. Um, and then we still rely on Polymer to do all the event normalization between mouse, touch, and pointer, and handling things like uh, touch action and scrolling. And jQuery is just dealing with the uh, plumbing for the event system to get it to work in old IE. So we have a proof of concept of this working. Uh, we've already gotten our changes for Polymer pushed upstream. Uh, and we now have a jQuery pointer events repo, which houses uh, the, the plumbing to make Polymer work with jQuery. Uh, so if anyone's interested in helping out with getting pointer events in front of everybody, the jQuery pointer events repo in the jQuery organization is uh, a great place to come and help out. This will be used in the interaction rewrites in jQuery UI, and it will replace the um, virtual mouse abstraction in jQuery mobile. So when I discussed focus handling for dialogues earlier, I mentioned ARIA. How many people in this room know what ARIA is? Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so for those that don't know, ARIA is just a set of attributes which defines roles and states uh, that map to the accessibility layer in the operating system. Uh, so it provides a, a meaningful way to provide additional semantics about what the page is doing, right? Because now we're building much more complex widgets and apps uh, that the DOM doesn't have native representations for. So accessibility testing is actually quite difficult. Uh, there are a variety of disabilities and assistive technologies that need to be accounted for. And even giving a seemingly straightforward assistive technology like a screen reader, it takes a lot of knowledge and experience to use it properly. Right? So uh, as, as just a random developer picking up a screen reader, you're not going to use it the same way as someone who relies on that technology day in and day out. So knowing how to actually properly test with a screen reader is pretty difficult. And then screen readers are just one of many ways that people might be accessing your content. So just like conforming to standard HTML and DOM APIs won't prevent you from hitting browser bugs, conforming to the ARIA APIs won't prevent you from hitting uh, assistive technology bugs. So in order to ensure that jQuery UI is as accessible as possible, we work with various individuals, teams, and communities. Uh, we've worked with the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University, uh, the Pasiello Group, DQ Systems, Mozilla's Accessibility Team, and more. Uh, members of our team are also, are also active on the WebAIM mailing list, which is a great resource if you're looking for uh, just any help with 
um, making a certain part of your site accessible, or you're just looking for advice on how to handle a scenario. Uh, in 2011, we organized an ARIA hackathon in collaboration with the IDRC at OCAD University. The event was open to the public, and it was intended to provide a full range of information on accessibility in ARIA, uh, as well as reviewing and improving jQueryWise accessibility. There were several great presentations uh, that, uh, uh, <laughs> Yes, there were several great presentations at the ARIA Hackathon. Um, David Balter, the accessibility engineering manager at Mozilla, gave a presentation on um, how accessible information is exposed from the browser to the operating system and like how uh, each different operating system and each different browser deals with this differently. And so you you know, when you have your browser support matrix, uh, just multiply that by accessibility layer matrix, and then multiply that by assistive technology matrix, and it gets pretty unwieldy. Um, there was also a walkthrough of various assistive technologies by Colin Clark. So the IDRC actually has a room full of different types of assistive technologies, things like uh, braille outputs, screen readers, screen magnifiers, all kinds of devices. Uh, so Colin Clark gave a walkthrough of all those different devices and how they work and how you would, you know, a few examples of how you would make sure that your content is accessible through those. Uh, and then there was a real world demonstration of screen reader usage by Jenna Assumption, who's a blind accessibility consultant. Uh, so even with all of this expertise, most things still don't have a straightforward solution. So for example, when we were implementing autocomplete, the ARIA specification provides three different models for uh, which states and properties to use. And it's based on uh, how you're managing focus and whether the value of the text field is changing as you're navigating through the suggestions. So given the model that we use, where the list of suggestions is displayed but the focus remains within the text field, the specification requires us to use ARIA Active Descendant to indicate which item is active during navigation. But unfortunately, this pre presents uh, a variety of issues in different browsers and assistive technologies. So after extensive testing and discussion with several groups, we decided to use Live Regions to effectively hack around the problem. Live Regions provide a buffer of text to be announced. Um, so by resorting to Live Regions, we basically throw semantics to the side and just provide verbatim text for uh, the screen reader to, to say. So this makes live regions the ultimate hack. Like it's a, it's a fallback, but it's a fallback that comes at the price of um, starting from nothing, right? Because you, you literally just have raw text to, to announce. So surprisingly, even this wasn't enough to get it working properly. Uh, and this was discovered by Dylan Barrel at DQ Systems. Our initial implementation used polite regions. And polite regions tell the assistive technology that it should only make an announcement at the next graceful opportunity. Uh, so how, how many people have ever seen somebody use a screen reader? Yeah, so you know, like, it, it tends to read extremely fast, and there's a ton of information on a page. So screen readers can get really noisy. And so using a polite region says, you know, if the screen reader is being really noisy, the user's navigating really quickly, don't announce everything. Just when you get, a, when you get an opportunity, announce the most recent item that they navigated to. Um, and that was, that was the idea, right? It would be the best implementation. You're just going to hear the most relevant information. Um, but Dylan discovered that it wasn't working in certain situations. So his solution was to use an assertive region, which will always tell you when there are changes. Um, but then he put are your relevant equals additions. So the idea here is that it's only going to announce when new content is added. So rather than replacing the content, so you know, as you're navigating, we were saying you're on A, you're on B, you're on C, we would remove A from the live region and just put B in there so that that was the only thing being announced. Uh, he said are your relevant equals additions and kept adding messages to the live region. And then he would hide the previous messages because there were bugs in JAWS, which is a popular screen reader for Windows, and there was a bug in VoiceOver, which is the screen reader for OS X, and sometimes they would just read all the messages anyway. Uh, so he had to hide the previous messages to prevent them from reading them again. So we now have a hack on top of a hack uh, just to announce suggestions for an autocomplete menu, which seems fairly straightforward and actually has a specific implementation in the ARIA authoring practices. Um, so you guys all thought that dealing with IE6 was a pain, and we get to deal with this all the time. 
So accessibility is an extremely large problem to tackle, and while many developers are aware of the basics, most developers don't have a deep understanding of all the intricacies involved, and that's why it's so important for us to work with other members of the community that do have that experience and knowledge, so that we can make sure that we're actually addressing all the issues. Uh, so dealing with globalization is the same. How many people have dealt with internationalization and localization? Oh, good amount of you, that's good. Um, so for a long time, the only part of jQuery UI that dealt with this at all was Date Picker. Uh, Date Picker has always had support for various languages, and we've been relying on the community to provide all of the translations. Um, so we've been doing that for a few years now, and it's a really haphazard way to manage our data. We're constantly getting pull requests to fix mistakes from other people that submitted the locales, and like it's pretty hard for our team to know if the data that people are providing to us is correct. Um, so we just keep getting pull requests from people, and then we have to try and figure out, you know, is this pull request legitimate? So a few years ago, we decided that we should have a more comprehensive solution. Uh, so we started working with Microsoft to build a new project called Globalize. Uh, Dave Reed built the initial implementation based on Microsoft's .NET implementation for globalization. And we primed the locale data with a JSON representation of the data that uh, .NET ships with. So while this increased our locales from about 70 to 350, we were still using a custom set of data and we kept getting pull requests to fix the data. Uh, so we looked at what else was available and decided that the Unicode Consortium was the best resource to look to for a canonical data source. So we're now switching Globalize to use the Unicode Common Locale Data Repository, which is more commonly referred to as CLDR, and we're going to stop maintaining our own localization files. So this means we can stop dealing with pull requests about locales. Uh, if there is an act, like, a legitimate issue in one of the locales, then the change needs to happen upstream at the Unicode Consortium and they will release it in the next version of CLDR, and then we will have it available to us. Uh, so this is a m massive undertaking, and it's being led by, uh, should I say your name properly? Oh, I'll try this. Rafael Chaffier? All right. We just call him Rafael. Uh, <laughs> so delegating to CLDR for all the data uh, makes it easier for us to collaborate with other projects as well. So in fact, we're actually working with uh, Moment.js and Wikipedia to ensure that our end users can use a single set of data regardless of how many tools they're using for globalization. Uh, so the Unicode, Unicode Consortium's main files are in XML, but they've recently started providing them in JSON. And we've found a few issues, so we're working to get fixes upstream. Uh, and Raphael has created CLDRJS, uh, which makes it easy to pull data out of those JSON files and uh, use them without having to deal with like deep object traversal and um, trying to like look at different data sources to mash together a locale information. Um, so that serves as a low level utility for other projects to build on top of. So it just gives us another common point uh, for collaborating with other projects. So we're holding regular meetings with Wikipedia and Moment.js to make sure that our goals stay aligned and keep collaboration as, a, as productive as it can be. So you can expect future versions of Moment.js to um, use CLDR and play well with Globalize. And the vast amount of localized content on Wikipedia uh, ensures that you know, our solutions are going to work at scale. And so hopefully we'll be solving problems for the entire community. Uh, so we've also reached out to Twitter because they have a CLDR project as well. Um, they have expressed interest in switching to using the common data sources for CLDR, but they, they don't currently have time to implement that. Uh, so hopefully at some point, Twitter will also be using the same data sources, and so regardless of which projects you're using, you'll be able to uh, benefit from all the common infrastructure. Uh, so if you're interested in hearing more about Globalize, you should attend Raphael's talk. Uh, it's right before lunch. And we also spend time collaborating with other open source uh, projects that use jQuery UI. And we do this to ensure that we're providing the functionality they need and to make sure that um, you know, they're using it, our widgets, the, the most effective way for their projects. Um, so as you're probably aware, jQuery and WordPress have a great relationship. WordPress is a founding member of the jQuery Foundation and a diamond sponsor of this conference. Uh, and Andrew Nason, the lead developer for WordPress, spent a lot of time helping us get uh, jQuery WP content, which is 
what runs all of the jQuery websites. Um, he helped us getting that set up, uh, and so we now have a, a great system for managing all our websites. The WordPress team is also extremely fast at updating, so anytime jQuery Core and jQuery Y release new versions, they tend to land in WordPress anywhere from a few minutes after the release to like a day after the release. Um, sometimes new versions land in WordPress before we even get our blog post out. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, just like jQuery can get um, implementations in front of lots of users to help out standards teams, uh, WordPress is able to get jQuery in front of tons of users. Uh, and this is really beneficial for us because they can push out betas and RCs and get them in front of millions of developers and report information back to the jQuery team before we release a final version. Uh, so most recently, we, we worked with members of the WordPress team to land support for CSS touch action property in jQuery UI. Uh, and so touch action makes uh, our interactions work properly on Windows touch devices that have pointer events. Uh, and this will soon affect other devices as well. Uh, so landing touch action support actually turned out to require even more community collaboration, and I think this is a great little mini story in itself. So TJ Vantol from the jQuery UI team put together a pull request to uh, add the touch support to the interactions. Uh, but the unit test failed because we used grunt contrib CSS lint, uh, and because touch action is so new, the linter was identifying touch action as an invalid property. So as you might expect, grunt contrib CSS lint require, uh, relies on Nicole Sullivan's CSS lint in order to do the actual linting. But CSS lint in turn relies on Nicholas Sackis's parser lib to determine if the property uh, is valid or not. So TJ sent a patch to add touch action to parser lib. And then we had to wait for that to propagate all the way back up to grunt contrib CSS lint. Uh, so this is the kind of collaboration that we love seeing happening in the open source community. And I, I mean, everybody is benefiting, right? We, we just wanted to get our interactions working with touch action, uh, but now everybody that uses parsalib, CSS lint, or grunt, grunt contrib CSS lint now has support for touch action. Um, so we also have two-way collaboration with the Drupal team. Members of the Drupal accessibility team have provided a lot of testing and suggestions for improvements in jQuery UI. Uh, we're also working on increasing our collaboration by replacing Drupal's own custom JavaScript widgets with jQuery UI widgets. And this frees their team up to focus on building a solid CMS rather than dealing with all the intricacies of building JavaScript widgets. Um, in the past, we've even adjusted our roadmap to ship certain uh, improvements in time for Drupal's code freeze. Uh, and so uh, we, we landed some accessibility updates to dialog in uh, jQuery Y110. And if, if anyone was paying attention to the release time frame, this jQuery Y110 was the fastest release we've ever done. It was three months for a, stable, for a major release. Uh, and that's because we, we actually designed that release specifically to address a need of Drupal and get it out as soon as possible. So we want to make sure that we're serving other open source projects as well. So if anybody in here is working on large open source projects that is using or should be using jQuery UI, um, you should contact us if you have any questions or concerns, or you could just find us in the hallway during the conference. Uh, and we've also created a ton of open source projects ourselves to support jQuery UI, or just to improve our workflow while working on jQuery UI. Many of these tools are used in several jQuery projects or by several team members on uh, the jQuery team. So during the course of a normal day, I probably viewed diffs dozens of times. Uh, but viewing diffs in terminal is nowhere near as nice as viewing diffs in GitHub. But I don't want to make commits just to push them to GitHub so I can look at a diff. Uh, so I built a module called Pretty Diff, which you can install using npm install g pretty diff, which is true for most of the modules I'll be talking about. Uh, and it just generates GitHub style diffs. Uh, it uses the same exact API as git diff. You just call uh, git pretty diff instead, and you end up with a page that looks very similar to GitHub. Uh, so once I'm happy with my changes, I run my test through Grunt. How many people are using Grunt? And how many people have a Grunt t-shirt? 
Um, so we've built a few grunt modules that we use in jQuery UI. Jern Zephyr, the dev lead for jQuery UI, created grunt HTML. And grunt HTML lints all of our demos and tests to ensure that we have valid markup. And this module built on top of validator.new. And we worked with Mike Smith to get the necessary updates into validator.new so that uh, we could lint our files in a matter of seconds instead of minutes. Um, so Yearn also built Grunt CSS, which handles CSS minification and linting. Uh, that's been replaced by Grunt, Grunt Contrib CSS Min and Grunt Contrib CSS Lint, which he helps maintain. So once I'm ready to commit, Yearn's newest project called Commit Please ensures that my commit message uh, conforms to the commit message style guide for all jQuery projects. It runs as a commit message hook in Git, and if the message doesn't conform to the style guide, it will reject the commit. Uh, so once I push the commit to GitHub, we kick off a job in test swarm. Uh, we use node test swarm, also written by Yearn, to submit the appropriate tests to our test swarm instance, and then we spawn browser stack clients. Um, and we use test swarm browser stack, which was written by Clark Allen, uh, which uses one of my modules, node browser stack, to spawn the actual browser stack workers, and then those connect to our test swarm instance and report data back to uh, Jenkins. Uh, so every once in a while we need to track down where some code came from or why something is done a certain way. And although git blame helps here, it's really painful if you need to keep recursing through the history to find the actual change you care about. Uh, even using GitHub's blame uh, doesn't really uh, make this too simple to do. It's, it's actually pretty painful. Um, so it bothered me enough that I built a tool called recursive blame which walks through the history of your project and it finds matches for a regex pattern. Um, it'll follow file renames and it can even be used to find code that no longer exists. So if you know you had code in your project at some point and you remember either the function name or a certain thing that was specific to it and you can't remember why it was removed and it's be like something really hard to track down because you, the code's not there anymore, you can just do a search for that code. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, so you can do a search for that code and it'll actually walk the history until it finds the code. And uh, once it finds the code, it will show you what commit it was removed in. We also maintain a list of all contributors to jQuery UI in the authors.txt file. And in order to keep this up to date, I created a grunt task called grunt git authors. And it just looks through the history of the project and gathers the name of all the contributors in the order of first contribution and make sure that the list is unique, and if you have a mail map, it will respect your mail map. Um, so how many people use IRC notifications for GitHub events? Woo! No, why not? How many people use GitHub during the day, like at their, yeah? And you guys don't have, how many people use IRC during the day? Oh, not that many, okay. so. For jQuery projects, we have um, IRC notifications when somebody pushes uh, to the repository, when somebody creates an issue, and when somebody opens a pull request. Um, so configuring uh, these webhooks or the IRC hooks is actually really painful. Did anybody see that GitHub just modified their webhook configuration page like yesterday or two days ago? Uh, so they've had these hooks forever and during this conference is the first time that they've made it possible to use their web UI to configure what events you get notifications for. Uh, previously, you had to go through the API and it was a huge pain to deal with because uh, there's no way in the UI to even get the ID of the hook that you wanna modify, so you have to like, use the API to search for all your hooks and then filter through them to find the one that you want based on some other setting, like which IRC channel it's notifying, uh, and then create another API request that modifies that with the list of events you care about. Uh, so in order to, to make this simpler, I created a project called Hookup. You can install it as a global NPM package and use it as, as a command line tool, or you can use it as a node module, uh, and it makes updating your hooks much easier, because you can just say, I want to take the hook for this URL and make it listen to these events, and it will search to see if the hook already exists, and if it does, it'll update it. If it doesn't, it'll create it. Um, so we use that to make sure that all of the jQuery projects are sending all the notifications we want. 
so hook up builds on top of a simpler module called GitHub Request, which simplifies API calls to GitHub. Uh, and finally, we have tools for managing our websites. So even though we use WordPress for all of our sites, we manage our content in Git, uh, and then we host it on GitHub. So that makes it you know, the same contribution model as we have for all of our code projects. So anybody can just send a pull request to update content on our websites. But in order to sync the data between Git and WordPress, uh, we use Grunt WordPress, which builds on, upon Node WordPress, uh, which utilizes WordPress's built-in XML RPC API, and um, all of this stuff is uh, just running on every commit and on every tag. Uh, so during the transition to the new site setup, we were updating our dependencies pretty frequently, right? Because we, we have a couple of dependencies that manage how the content is generated from Git, because we use markdown files and HTML files and XML files for the actual source, uh, but we need HTML and we need like syntax highlighting and all that stuff. Um, so we kept, we're updating our dependencies that do all of that pretty frequently. And we noticed that people kept getting out of sync because it's, it's not very common for people to run an NPM install every time they do a pull. And there's, there's really no easy way to track uh, you know, when there are changes to package, package JSON. So Yearn created a module called Grunt Check Modules, and it, all it does is look at uh, what you have installed and what your package JSON says you should have installed, and if they don't match, it'll fail the Grunt build. Uh, so that way, instead of having people deploy to their local site during, with tests and have you know, the modules be out of date and so the site doesn't really work properly anymore, uh, the build, the deploy just fails right away and says you, your modules are out of date. Um, so again, all of these tools are open source. They're built to be used in other projects. And while we built them to help uh, with our work on jQuery UI, we found them invaluable while working on other projects. So finally, I'd like to mention the support we have from browser vendors. Some browser vendors are better than others when it comes to dealing with like bug trackers and actually being able to see what's going on. Uh, but since that's not something jQuery UI specific, I won't really go into detail about that. Uh, but I would like to say that Chromium has a meta ticket for tracking bugs that affect jQuery. And they actually take that, um, they, they treat it as pretty high priority. So if there's a bug that is affecting jQuery, it will get linked to from this meta ticket. And they just constantly check the meta ticket to see if there are open uh, tickets that are being linked to it. So even outside the bug trackers, we have a direct line of communication with all of the browser vendors other than Apple, although I think maybe like one or two people have connections to Apple. Uh, so Tony Ross from Microsoft has been uh, a huge help with tracking down issues in IE and working around IE bugs. There are actually um, several bug fixes in our code that came from Microsoft. Uh, Boris Barsky from Mozilla is our Firefox liaison, and he's just a, a great resource for general web development, uh, web compat, history of HTML, and just any general questions we have about various things like why do browsers treat encoding in such a stupid way? Like he'll actually have uh, historical answers for that. Um, so Mike West and Paul Irish from Google are available on the jQuery Dev IRC channel, along with Mike Taylor, uh, who works for Mozilla. He previously worked for Opera. And we also use non-JPRE IRC channels and mailing lists to communicate with several others. Uh, so hopefully this look behind the scenes of jQuery UI has shown how important the community is. So we wouldn't be uh, nearly as successful as we are today if it weren't for the, all the help of the community. So uh, last, com last question for the audience is, um, how many people have contributed to any open source project? Awesome. Give, it, give them a round of hand. So that's, that's it. Uh, we, I mean, we've done tons of other work with the community, but this was just kind of a run through of some of the more recent stuff and uh, just some insight into how many other projects help us because you know, our team really is small and the, the help of the community is really important.